Hello and welcome to episode 59 of the Synergen Leadership Podcast. For those of you who are listening for the first time, my name is Julian Carl and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Synergen Group. I'm passionate about all things leadership and management, so passionate in fact that I decided to start a podcast about it. And here we are in season two and my purpose for the podcast continues to be the same, to raise the standard of leadership. In today's show, I speak with Jeremy Nichols, who is the author of The Power of Culture, How to Transform Your Organization Through the One Thing That Is Hard to Overlook and Difficult to Shift. As the owner of the boutique consultancy Composure, Jeremy helps organizations to create cultures and develop their leaders to improve the growth and performance of their organizations, teams, and individuals. With over 25 years in the management consultancy industry, Jeremy has been a key advisor to many CEOs, boards, executive teams, business unit leaders, and HR professionals. He has also led and managed four consultancies, all at different stages of development. He's also an experienced board member and has held board positions with Melbourne Football Club, Signcraft, and iLeap, which is a Melbourne University-sponsored initiative for Indigenous leadership excellence. All of this means that his clients get access to a diversity of experience, deep expertise, and proven methodologies to help them develop their people so they can successfully navigate through the challenges they face. Through a focus on culture and leadership, Jeremy helps clients increase financial performance, manage risk, and enhance their reputation. Now, during the course of the conversation, we explore Jeremy's book in detail. I start off by asking Jeremy why did he decide to write the book. We speak about the four distinct phases of culture and why organisations need to recognise which phase they are in. We explore the importance of having a culture roadmap and why leadership is crucial. And I finish the interview off by asking Jeremy about what the best next step is and what we should be looking for. So keep listening and as always, would really like to hear your thoughts about the interview with Jeremy Nichols, author of The Power of Culture. Happy listening. Welcome to the Synergen Leadership Podcast with Julian Carl. Julian returns in 2019 with weekly conversations with leaders and authors from Australia and around the world, giving you the opportunity to share in their journey and learn from their expertise and knowledge. Julian also shares some of the tools and techniques he uses as a leader, mentor and facilitator, helping you to build your leadership capability and improve your confidence as a leader. Welcome, Jeremy, to the Synergen Leadership Podcast. Really happy that you've taken the time to come out to uh, be on the show and especially happy because we're, we're recording it from Synergen HQ. It's only the second time that we've done it at our site, so that's great. So that everyone has a uh, sense of you, who is Jeremy Nichols. Well, thank you, Julian, for having me. Uh, it's uh, um, an enjoyable chance to talk a bit about um, some of the things that I've been doing and, and particularly around the book that I've created. So who's Jeremy Nichols? Well, I've been working in the management consulting industry for 25 years. Um, And I think the the difference that I've been doing in that space is both managing consulting firms and continuing to consult to clients. So um, so I get both sides of the story. Uh, it's, It's often easier to advise. It's often harder to do. And so I've been had the fortunate experience of actually managing uh, consultants um, in both global firms, Australian listed firms, uh, boutique firms over that 25 years or so, and uh, currently run my own boutique firm, which I started uh, five and a half years ago, called Composure Group. And uh, so we specialise in culture leadership and how we help leaders uh, transform their businesses through their people and culture. So we're here to talk about uh, your book today, The Power of Culture, How to Transform Your Organization Through the One Thing That Is Hard to Overlook and Difficult to Shift. Why did you decide to write a book on culture? Mm -hmm. Well, having worked in it for a long time and and, uh, understanding that people have a somewhat sometimes a simplistic view because culture can be used as a word that is cures all ills or describes all the problems um, within an organisation. But when you unpack, well, what does culture really mean, particularly when you're talking with leaders, is they're going, oh, I'm not quite sure. It might be a very thin way of just saying, oh, what's the way things are done around here? Yes. But what drives that and how important is culture to helping you deliver your strategy? And how important is it that might be holding you back? 
So I figured that um, with the work that I've been doing for a long time, I've been wanting to write a book for a while um, and to really help leaders in particular to understand, one, the complexity of culture, because it is complex because we're dealing with human beings, um, also to help them navigate you know, the, this complexity and, and, and be able to understand that there's certain pathways that can get you through your culture journey and and to be able to provide a book that I deliberately wrote it more as a how-to as opposed to a philosophical direction. Um, that's where I think it uh, is a tangible. So the re reason I wanted to do it is a tangible way that people could understand this journey that they're on, um, use some good frameworks that they can use to help um think about their journey and plan their journey and do something about it. Uh, well, I want to read a uh, short excerpt from the book because it, um, it, it resonated with me and it's from part of the, the, the preface. The reality is you get a culture whether you like it or not. As a matter of fact, you have one right now. Even as you read this, your culture is being shaped and shifted by a range of culture factors. It is important to know what the factors are that drive your current culture and therefore what you need to focus on to shift your existing culture. It is also critical to define the culture qualities you believe will best give you the best chance of success. Understanding what factors drive and influence your culture and defining the culture you need to succeed are the critical ingredients to creating a strong, robust and sustainable organisation. So I'm curious around that. How do people react when you go in and look at their business and let them know that they might have a few culture challenges. <laughs> yeah, well, I always uh, intrigued when leaders go, um, uninformed leaders would go, oh, yeah, this culture stuff, you know, we, we don't have a culture here. Well, people are making choices in the way they work every moment of the day. Right. And what we're looking at and helping leaders understand why are they making those choices. And that's where we start to talk about the factors, so the cultural factors. So there's a range of things that people are influenced by, whether it's a leader themselves and what how they interact with them. Um, it could be around the structure. It could be around the systems that are in place, whether it's reward systems and so on. So there's a, a range of factors that influence how they are making choices in the way that they are making decisions in what they do or not do. So... Once you start to explore that, then people go, oh, right, we actually do have a culture in here. And then the next question is, as I said before, is it helping or hindering? So the, the, the idea is starting to understand the layers that create this culture, understanding what is creating it, and therefore if you know what is creating it and you want to shift it, by logic, you focus on those factors that are having the biggest influence on your culture right now. The second layer to that, as, as you articulated, which is being really clear about the qualities that you're aiming for. And so I could, uh, I could pick up the paper today and there'll be um, probably 10, 20, 30 maybe references to culture and people might be describing, oh, we, we need an innovative culture. And the next article on a business might be saying we need a customer centric culture and the next article is we need a more collaborative culture we need a more productive culture accountable culture and so the question then is well, what culture do you know because they may be all valuable all important um, but it's really hard to do all of those things at once so that's where we start to make that link to an organization strategy because if you're not clear about where you're wanting to go it doesn't really matter which culture you're going to get. Yeah. So that's that's the, the connection that we try to help people navigate that okay. challenge. So if, obviously this is an audio only, but in, uh, on the front cover of your book, there, there's a picture of an elephant. Mm. And in, the, uh, in Chapter 1, you talk about culture being the elephant in the room. Mm. You know, I'd like to explore that a little. Yeah, well, I'm, a, I'm big on stories. For and when we are advising clients and consulting with them, uh, it's helping people remember narratives. They remember stories. They don't remember the, the third dot point on your fourth slide. And so, when doing that and listening to my own advice, is starting to look at well, what's a what's a narrative? What's a what's um, a picture that helps understand culture 
in a metaphoric sense. So there's two sides to the elephant. So the elephant in the room is a, a you know, classic mm. conversation, which is you know when people know that the elephant is in the room, but they're not prepared to recognise it, talk about it, um, but they all know it's there. It's sort of the unsaid thing. So we need to bring the elephant into the conversation, metaphorically being the culture. So the other story is when you read the book, and not to ruin the book in the, the first few chapters, but it's based on a, um, an Indian fable where three blind men describing an elephant. You know, so the three blind men, well, one, ele- one blind man saying the, uh, the elephant looks like a it looks like a hose. I know what an elephant looks like. It looks like a hose. It's long and cylindrical and water comes out of it. An elephant's like a hose. And the other blind man's going, no, it's not. It's like a rope with a tassel on the end. That's what an elephant looks like. So they have this bickering and this fighting about what an elephant looks like. And the third blind man going, I don't know what you're carrying on about. An elephant's like a tree trunk. That's what an elephant looks like. So as you'd expect, they're all correct. They just have their lens on what the culture looks like. And if you really want your organisation's culture, metaphorically the elephant, what the leaders need to do is start to look at it from the holistic perspective, not just what they see, not just what they touch. And so when you are really starting to shift a culture, the critical piece you've got to get right is the senior leaders aligning around. One is it's important. Secondly, what is it that we need? And thirdly, how do we shift it? So, mm. you, you, you've got a term here which I, I'm curious about. Something that, a culturalist. What's yeah. a what's a culturalist? <laughs> a made up word. <laughs> okay. um, I remember a Seinfeld a Seinfeld episode many years ago that uh, it was a bit of a Seinfeld uh, aficionado, and they um, and Jerry put out a word, and they made it up, made the word up. And uh, in the cafe, and they went, let's see what happens to this word. So they just started putting it into conversation. And um, and uh, a couple of weeks later, they started seeing people use the word based on, you know, just putting it out there. So um, that's sort of the background <laughs> to it. But a culturalist in the context of a culture specialist, you know, someone as a leader, what we're wanting to do is create leaders having a much better understanding, a deeper understanding of what culture is and obviously why it's important. But for them to be skilled to recognise that culture is important and particularly recognise what they can do about it. So we're wanting to create culturalists or culture specialists, the people that it's part of the vernacular of a leader. It's not just something that's thin and they get to once every year when they go off on a two-day offsite. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to start really digging deep into to some of the frameworks, and I think that's one of the things I really liked about your book, and I'm going to do a shameless plug on your behalf. I think every listener should go out and, and buy the book, and we'll talk more about that at oh, the end no, as well. No, no, thank you, John. We don't appreciate right. that. But um, I, was, I was intrigued by this idea of the journey of an awakening the collective consciousness of an organisation to the power of culture has four distinct phases. So I'd like to explore those four phases if we can. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, um, well, it's the critical phases of, um, firstly, is awareness, right? So one is, that's the, that's the elephant in the room, right? So we just need to become far more aware. And when you start to have these conversations, and hopefully that's where the book triggers that conversation where people are going, I wasn't aware of one what culture was really about, and I wasn't aware of the power of it. I wasn't aware of the impact that I was having on it. So that's that's the awareness phase. The second is around knowledge. So it is around understanding in a deeper way what culture is about, which is a patterns of behaviour. Right? And then when you start to look at those patterns of behaviour, what drives behaviour? And that's a whole other field. You know, it's not another field. It's part of the, the critical piece. So knowledge of why do people work the way they do in the organisations, particularly in a behavioural aspect? So that's increasing knowledge. The third thing is then connecting those bits of knowledge so you get insight. So one of the things that I think um, I think leaders really develop a great, a much greater capability is connecting the dots. So the insight comes from, well, if I do this, that's going to affect that. So that insight it becomes the third phase, um, but it's only dependent on your knowledge and certainly, obviously, the foundation of awareness. 
And the fifth one is wisdom, you know, so, or fourth one is wisdom, which is really starting to see the bigger picture of culture and its connection to driving the organization going forward. Okay. And I'm not a, I'm not a very uh, strong maths person. Mm. It's not, it's not my, my strength. I don't make no claim to it, but you, you've got an equation in there or a formula about power of culture. Are you able to, to, to share with the, the, the listeners what that is? Yeah, visually start to talk around that uh, formula that's in the book. So yeah. um, I, the reason I did this, one one is trying to get leaders to talk their language. And so ultimately I've been told that I'm quite pragmatic in the way that I talk about culture because I do very much connect it into business because I've run businesses. So um, so the first port of call when you're talking to an organisation uh, or leaders is what is it that you want? They say, oh, I want better performance. But what's performance look like? And usually it can be around things like, well, I want to increase revenue, profit. So there's a financial performance. But there's more than that because performance is also, when you start to look at some of the examples that we see in Royal Commission of Banks and so on, is risk. So they start to look at, well, performance is not only going forward, but performance is also about minimising risk. Oh, okay, so that's important. Then other people start to look at performance in terms of their brand, you know, their reputation, customers, you know, what they say and, and talk about you as a business. So that's a performance measure. And the fourth one I would look at would be talent, you know, because performance then becomes the type of talent that want to come and work for you, the quality of talent that you keep, and really the talent that is, um, I suppose, moved on because they're not performing to the level that you want. So that's the performance bit. So that's really where we start. And then to get there for a very simple simple formula is S plus L plus M, right, in the first instance. The S is strategy. To get performance, you've got to have a clear strategy. Pretty obvious, got to have a direction. The L is around leadership. So you've got to have leaders who not only know the strategy, but are really clear, consistent, and compelling in the way that they connect people into that strategy. The, the M is around management. So you've got to have the systems, the structure, the organisation to deliver the strategy with leaders who are really connecting people into that future. And you've got to have the right systems and structure. So where does culture fit? Some people go, oh, well, it's just a plus C. I see it differently because with all the research on when you get organisations who get their culture right and put effort into their culture, it becomes to the power of. So two to the power of three is much more than two plus two plus two. All right? So what the culture to the power of, so where the one of the elements of why I called it the power of culture as a book, was from a mathematical point of view, you'll get far bigger return if you get your culture three times better than what it currently is, even four times better, you get this exponential effect. Hmm. I was. I'm curious, and I and you, what you just said then triggered this this question for me. Is I was actually texting um, someone last night, and we were just having a bit of a conversation. She just started a new role as a as a chief people and culture officer. Mm -hmm. That's people and culture is replacing HR. Uh, with that change in just in terminology, are you noticing? that there's becoming a bigger focus on the culture in an organisation, that they're realising they have to do something about it mm. or at least try to manage it. Mm. Do you know where the, the term human resources come from? Uh, no, I don't know the origin. Yeah, no. The origin was um, because big mind sites, um, they were realise the importance of people, but they dug out resources, they <laughs> shipped the resources, and they had human resources to make that work. So um, that's where the terminology comes from, is my understanding. So the the shift of starting to see human resources more than just uh, a commodity is where the term people and culture, and you know, it, it's, it's certainly the last 10 years, at least in the last five, is, is a real shift and just symbolically as a title saying, they're more than just resources and commodity. So the, the, I think that is a symbolic change and the way that people are seeing it to term it people and culture. Some people get cynical about that, but mm -hmm. I'm going symbolically. The cynicism comes is that their role change. 
Does the attitude change? Do leaders see the head of people and culture differently compared to where they might have been the head of HR? Mm -hmm. Well, that's maybe, maybe not. Um, but certainly talking with executives and executive teams, they're recognising the importance of doing it. So it's no longer the elephant in the room. And the reason that becomes even more heightened is, you only, as I said before, you only have to pick up the papers. There's a, there's a lot of in-your-face um, discussions around what culture is and the impact it has. It's, it's almost um, overwhelming in some respects. But again, I'll go back to people talk about, oh, yeah, it's the culture, but don't really know exactly what's driving that or under, underlying what's impacting it. So, mm. so I'm curious about this idea that um, how organisational culture and employee engagement differ. And you, you give a, in the book a, a number of uh, key ideas here. I'd like to just talk through a couple of those, but you talk about organisational culture being a construct and employee engagement being an individual construct. I'm mm. curious to talk through mm. that a bit. Yeah, so um, a lot of organisations do engage in surveys, right? And, um, you know, it gives good data. And it, we we look at it and saying, yep, it's important to do engagement surveys because it gives you a sense of how people are feeling. We see that as an individual construct. So what you're asking people is saying, well, how do you feel about working in the organisation? Do you want to, in simple terms, do you want to, what do you say about the organisation? Do you want to stay and do you want to strive in this place? So that's really important data. Um, but there's also limited, if that's the only data you're looking at in trying to get a viewpoint from employees. The cultural um, surveys that we do, so we, we look at the constructs of culture is a different one because it's actually a, it's an organisational construct. So rather than asking you how you feel about working here, we're asking you, what do you see? What do you experience? What is going on in this organisation? So as an employee, we're asking you, what do you observe around this? The difference between that is that engagement surveys, if you are putting as an employee your data in, it's almost saying, Julian, I'm putting this data to you. You as my manager, you fix it. Right, because I'm you're wanting me to be more engaged, so you go and fix it. Whereas a culture survey and a culture diagnostic, then is that we're actually all in this together. So we believe that culture is more causal and engagement's more symptomatic, but both are really important. Both are still give you good data. That's that's the critical thing. It's not competing against the two, um, but some people just oh no, we 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 know what the culture is because we've done the engagement survey. I think it's a limited view. So when you do those uh, types of surveys and you're, ask, and you're asking the employees those types of questions, which is probably different to what they're used to, how do the employees react when mm. you're asking them that versus the normal engagement survey questions? Yeah, it's, it's a lot to do with the, the way you um, set it up. Yep. So importantly, we would often go to employees and talk a bit around this is what we're asking you to do, it's, and it's different to maybe what you've been asked in the past. Um, so that's that's crucial. What's interesting is when you actually share the data, and we're often sharing data, obviously, to exec teams, but even to boards, and they're so tuned to seeing engagement scores that they start to look at, well, if you get a poor culture score in a particular division, then, oh, my God, there must be something wrong with that division. And we're going, no, not necessarily because that division is actually giving a view on the organisation as a whole. So a good example, you know, I work with one client and their people and culture um, side uh, had a very, quite a poor culture score. And so that board's oh my God, there must be something wrong. Well, it wasn't it. It was just that they saw across the business all the messages that were indicating a more negative culture than a positive culture. They were just giving their view. So we're very careful on, you know, there's a real habit of trying to find the problem and and pinpointing that person. So that's why engagement surveys can be still helpful for that regard, but culture surveys are different. Okay. And you, you introduced the readers to this idea of a culture lens. What's a, what's a culture lens? Mm. <laughs> we have to read the book to get this real visual, but <laughs> essentially... Um, people have lenses in how they see the world, 
right? That's the, the concept, and it's based on their history, their experiences, their personality, on how they see the world. And the same applies when you are looking at an organisation, and if you have a culture lens, then that's your focus. You could have a brand lens. You could have a system lens. You could have a, an efficiency lens, whatever that looks like. So all we're talking about is when we're looking at organisation and we're encouraging leaders to learn the skills to be able to do this, is to look at If we look at it from a cultural lens, what do we see? And this is where the, um, I suppose the holistic construct of how culture fits to the strategy, how the culture fits based on history, because that's the influence of why you've got to where you are, and then you start to see the factors all coming together. So it's a if you if you get the book, you'll see it is like an eye, and it's the again a bit of a metaphoric sense of how do you look at culture within your business and trying to bring that construct together. Okay. And you, you talk about the three factors that uh, make up this this culture lens. I'd like to explore those. The first is the people factors. Mm. So what, what do we have to do around people? Yeah, one of the challenges with a very complex subject around culture is trying to make it easy to digest. So what um, with these factors is is trying to give enough information an idea that people are starting to look at culture, but when you explore each of them, there's there's a lot in it. So I'll put that sort of proviso in that context. But what we looked at is to help people get the layers, right? So when you're looking at a culture, we see that there are three main um, factors. So there's the people factors that are influencing a culture. There's the organisational factors that are influencing the culture and the appearance factors. So the first one that you asked around was the people factors. So when we look at that, three critical things. One is leadership because leaders have a big influence on the way people react and act in the business. So that is a critical factor that we would look at. Secondly would be around mindset. And what we're looking at there is what's the prevailing mindset within a business, which is no doubt created over time. You know when you go into some businesses and you just go, you know what? There is a clear mindset that customers are really important to us. You go to another business and they would say, there's a real mindset that collaboration is critical. You can go to other businesses where you go, it's just not. So what is, what's the mindset, what's the prevailing mindset that influences the way people behave? So that's, that's the second bit on the people factors. And the third one is talent. So if you don't get the right talent in your business who understand what's going on, are willing to grow and develop, etc., then that's going to influence your culture. And I think we've all been in organisations where there's certain talent that um, almost become insidious. I don't like to use the word cancer, but that's it. In essence, start to, um, for whatever reason they're doing it, that talent piece will affect the culture. And if you are not dealing with that and understanding why they're doing it, firstly, give them a chance to improve, but if they keep doing it, it's going to affect your culture ultimately. So they're the three ones in the people factor. Okay. Mm. But when, when you talk to CEOs, do they ever ask you how long it's going to take to mm. fix my culture? I had a CEO yesterday ask me that. Yeah, <laughs> so, I'm curious, what was the answer? <laughs> yeah. um, so my answer to this is, uh, as I said to him, as a great consulting response would be, it, it depends. <laughs> um, but... In reality, you can make a significant difference in your culture within a three to six month period. The critical piece is sustaining it. Right? So you can do a big bang. You can do a great you know, roadshow. You've done your culture qualities. You've put them together, beautiful posters. You've done a really good integration and people are going, wow, that's fantastic. But like a hit of, you know, a hit of sugar in the bloodstream, it can dissipate over time. What's the most important, and this is where we talk about the phase of the shaping, that's the shaping phase, is shifting. And the, uh, the, uh, lots of things will affect a culture, but obviously that people will only change the way they work, the way they behave, which ultimately is your culture, if they feel it's safe and genuine that they can move forward. So, um, so the shifting phase becomes really important, and therefore that can take closer to two, three, even four years. But it depends on what the starting point is. 
Right. So if an organisation is in dire trouble and they have to change by crisis, then you may get this significant shift quite quickly because they've got no choice. If you've got an organisation that is dying by you know, the thousand cuts sort of slowly, slowly, then you actually might see that that takes longer because people haven't got that impetus to really change. Shifting a culture from good to great, it's already pretty good, but hey, we've got to keep ahead of the game. Um, again, can can be a little, even a little bit harder sometimes because you're thinking, oh, well, it's okay. Why do we need to really change? So general rule of thumb, a long-winded way of asking a question, six months can make a big impact to sustain it. Three years is probably about right. Okay. And I, I, and I imagine that this, um, this phrase you talk about of a unifying purpose mm. very much contributes to that idea of how long it's going to take because if you get everyone on the same page... Shorten the, the time frame, is that right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, and the unifying purpose, um, you can call it a mission, you can call it you know, whatever you like, but it's I use the term unifying purpose more deliberately because a purpose statement on its own can become a marketing tagline and people can become quite cynical about that, except for those who create it. So we work with a lot of a lot of teams who um, who really start and they love their statements. They're going, this is fantastic, and then they go out and share it with people and they go, eh, not quite sure. So it's got to get beyond the statement. And that's where the unifying bit comes in because their ability to keep talking around uh, consistently over time and keep reinforming or reaffirming why this unifying purpose is important for us to come together and rally around. And you know, when you're, you would have read a lot of books like I do, um, and you look at these organisations who have been around for a while, they've got a very strong unifying purpose, you know, that, and they keep rallying towards it, then that defeats the cynicism in my book, you know, but they've put the effort into it. They haven't just gone, oh, that's a good statement, hopefully everyone gets it. I mean, connect people into it. That's the crucial part. Mm. One of the things I really liked uh, is this idea of a cultural roadmap because I'm a big fan of frameworks, models, tools, sort of what floats my boat really in terms of... Uh, oh, you love the book then. Yeah, yeah, exactly, <laughs> I do. And I especially like when there's a nice graphic to go with it. So, uh, and, and you alluded to it before, there's a couple of different or three different stages of this culture roadmap. Are you able to sort of give a high level of each stage because I'm going to dig a bit deeper yeah. in, but yeah. just a high level. Yeah, so it's always um, the way. If I go back to the book, you know, when you go to a new city or a new town, and let's say you're going overseas, and the book a lot of people reference is The Lonely Planet. Right? So, The Lonely Planet, as a book, becomes a really important resource before you go into that town on your journey. You want to know a bit about it. And so, this book is designed to do a bit of that. It's supposed to be your Lonely Planet guide before you start to enter into this into this um, into this journey when you're there you're going to have a somebody might come read the same book go to the same town but will have a completely different experience so the roadmap itself provides the frameworks it provides inside of the things you need to be looking for as a lonely planet book would do Um, when you're in it your experience is going to be different so how do you get that balance right because it is going to be different but how do you put some frameworks and put some handles around this so people just go oh my god i'm lost i'm lost in this new town so that's the that's the sort of the connecting piece the three phases are shaping shifting strengthening and if we start to look at the the key elements of each of those phases and again just trying to keep it simple and headlines these are the signposts take the analogy a bit further, these are the signposts in the shaping phase, which is one I referenced to before. You've got to get your execs, your senior leaders aligned. We've found that if you don't and you try to make it happen lower in the organisation, you can do a lot of work and a lot of really good work, but it can come undone really quickly. So you've got to get the execs aligned and a critical mass. You might not get everyone, a critical mass. Secondly is know what know what the culture is. So you really need to analyse it, find whatever form, but you need to get a baseline around what is our culture today. Thirdly is um, designing the future. So what is it the culture we need? And be really clear about that and be focused on a few things, not 
a million things. Um, I played a lot of footy, and if I had coaches who came to me with 15 things on the whiteboard that we had to do in that quarter, you know, most of the players would look at it and get lost after the third, so or third or fourth point. So that's where you need to be really clear about designing your culture and keep it simple. And the fourth bit in the shaping phase is that communicating and connecting. And this is the unique balance of how we talk about the top down, because their role is to shape the strategy. Their role is to really live and design, design and live that culture, but they're never going to make it happen unless they get the bottom up. So that's where the communication connecting, not waiting till it's all done before you start doing that. So that's the shaping phase. Um, the shifting phase, what we find is the biggest impact on cultures around the leadership. So what are you doing to transform leaders? Um, and that's a critical component we start to look at. Secondly, you start to build some activations, you know, culture activations as we call it. So that's, that's when you go back to your factors and saying, well, do we need to change our reward system? Do we need to change our performance system? Do we need to change the structure? Do we need to change our brand? Do we need to change the office space? Do we need to change who we are recruiting? Who do we need to exit? So that begins a series of activations that um, there's both quick wins and then the longer term year one object, year one projects as we call them. So get those right, then you start to build momentum. You know, so what are the things that you need to do to start to build momentum? What you find through these phases is an emotional reaction. People will respond, and, and this is the complexity bit. This is, oh, I thought we were doing all these things right. I stuck to the frameworks in your book, Jeremy, but something went awry. Part of it is this complexity is dealing with the emotions of change. Um, and there's, there's ways of understanding that but that's where leaders react because they've got their own emotions they're dealing with. So that's this, this phase is the really challenging phase about dealing with the emotional reactions because you get people going, yeah, I'm really with you. Other people going, yeah, I'm really with you, Julian. What I call that superficial acceptance. Mm-hmm. They go back to the work and go, what the hell is that all about? And then you've got your out, you know, the people who are actually just working against you effectively. So that's the, the, the shifting phase. Once you get through that, you start to get this um, multiplier effect. You know, go back to the formula, you start to get this real momentum that gets you into the strengthening phase. And this is where you see your roadmap, your activations. Uh, is a real plan because you can't do everything, so we're prioritising all that. You not only have built momentum, you're really maintaining it. And you start to see the initiatives that you thought were going to make a difference go way beyond whatever you believed as a leader. You know, I've experienced this as a leader. And you think, oh, yeah, we're working on the culture, and that it's, it's gone. I come up with ideas that are way beyond whatever I thought was possible. And that's, neat. that's when you know you're in that strengthening phase. So hopefully that wasn't too much of a mouthful. And, no, you know, no, so no, it was yeah. great because I wanted to explore the why. And what I liked is that you've listed – the role of leaders for each of the three phases. Mm. So I'm, I'm keen to explore that. So for this uh, shaping stage, what should the what should leaders be thinking about? What are the things they should be focusing on? Mm. Well, the first thing is to genuinely understand. Go back to the awareness stage. Yep. You know, re- genuinely understand and, and want to be want to see that culture is a critical part of not only their own personal success, their team success. And the ultimate organisation success. If that's why books like this and is designed to help people go, oh, I never thought of it that way, and put it higher on their order of priority, rather than I'll get to it, because that's when you you get a culture whether you like it or not. You either channel that energy to get the culture you need, or you just let it find its own way. Right? So, from a leadership perspective, it's it's genuinely wanting to do something about it. And, you know, what we test and we look at with leaders is, you know, the types of decisions you make. You know, if it's a customer-centric culture, then do you make decisions that are really customer-centric? The time and effort you put in to culture. And third thing would be that quality of interaction that you have with others. So if you are genuinely wanting to create a culture where people are important, then how often do you go and talk to people? 
how often do you interact with people? So I was talking with a client only this morning, actually, where they, they're a very capable team. I've worked with them five years. They're probably one of the better teams that I've worked with. Um, and they've talked about visibility of leadership three years ago. Well, guess what? They believe it. They do it. And the employees notice it. But they put the effort in because it'd be, it could be far easier to just sit in your office and get your head around a spreadsheet for those who like spreadsheets. So that's leadership, and, and leadership is such a big beast in itself. There's, you know, you've written mm. about leadership and Absolutely. a whole lot of different aspects around leadership, but uh, leading a culture has some particular aspects that you need to drive. Okay. I like your NCS. I'm very familiar with the NPS, the Net Promoter Score, but you have a Net Culture Score. Well, Talk to me about that. Yeah, um, it, it is a it is a direct connection. So it's asking a similar question. So it's really asking from a, a Net Promoter Score being that you know the you know what uh, um, people would say about your business, whether they recommend it to other other customers etc the same thing is we're really asking employees and it's probably the purest engagement score to be honest um, question and we just ask one question is whether they would um, you know actively promote the uh, the business as a place to work and you know we use the same formula as the net promoter school and it's a tough score because when you actually get that it's often a bit of a gulp factor for execs and leaders to see that score but what we've shown is that score is directly related to the culture scores that we see as well. So if your culture score is low, you tend to find that employees aren't actively promoting you or want to actively promote it and vice versa. Mm-hmm. What should leaders be doing during the shift stage? Because you've, you've given some, some key ideas here. What should they be doing? You know what? I think this is this is the hardest phase for leaders because they've got – they put themselves, if they've got the, the head around the shaping phase, they're putting themselves out there. And they're putting themselves to commit to a change. And when they start to see, and again, it depends on the organisation, but if you're trying to shift a, a, pretty, a pretty entrenched culture, that becomes really challenging because they're going to get forces, they're going to push back on them. Ultimately, people don't necessarily like change. Um, So they're going to get this force back and it takes a lot of resilience, takes a lot of composure to be able to um, withstand that. And if you're feeling alone, that makes it even harder. So that's why you need the alignment of executives and leaders to that you're in this together. Um, That's that that takes a very negative view in this culture change. Not all culture change like that, because some some people are just going, oh, thank thankfully you're doing something about this. So this shifting phase, and I think the critical piece is just really understanding, as I was saying before, those emotional reactions, because this is where it really gets heightened. In the shaping phase, people go, oh, this is really interesting. It looks good. You know, your posters are great. Yeah, I like the words. But when you, oh, you want me to do something different? Whoa, whoa, I actually wasn't expecting that. That's the hard phase. So this is where organisations get stuck. They don't get through the shifting phase and they start to go backwards. And if you're going to undertake any culture transformation, you need to be aware of what's coming, anticipate that risk, um, and find ways to be aware of it. And that's why we look at leaders and helping them get prepared to know what's coming up. So when they are confronted by it, they've got the skills to be able to do it. You explore this idea of subcultures in in organisations. This is something I'm fascinated about because even just uh, you think about people in general and you see all the little different subcultures that we all align ourselves to. How how does that happen in in an organisation and what do we do about it if we've got one division that has a particular culture and one has a different one? It's a it's a it's a really good question because I often get this asked this question with leaders going, oh, I work in a different state, so our culture's slightly different, and and that. Probably true. So the, the way I look at this is connecting it to society and connecting it to multiculturalism. Right? So in Australia, we've got a very multicultural society that works. On the whole, works pretty well. Now, if you look at it, you go overseas and you say you're Australian, 
people go, oh, you're Australian. Oh. What's a char what characterises an Australian? Generally, hardworking, fun, um, get on with life. Have a pretty relaxed look at life. So that's when we, if we get characterised by Australians overseas and sort of the Australian brand, generally what comes up. And yet, we're not all like we're not all like that. So we just characterise that. So then you look at states, and Queenslanders are different to New South Welshmen, to Victorians, to Taswegians. You start to look at there's nuances with that, and then you go into explore it a little bit further, and you get country Victorian versus metropolitan Victorian. So you start to it's almost like that Google Maps, and you just go lower and lower and lower, and yet we're all Australians. The same thing applies to organisations. You, you know, if you're looking at an organisation and it's you, you see whether it's Google or Apple or BHP or Woolworths or whatever it is, we tend to look at it and see that's what that's what they're like. That's the culture of Woolworths. But there's multiculturalism that fits. The key is for an organisation is to make sure you get that holistic picture right, all right? and don't let it just meander its way through, if you get that holistic picture, then you get the richness of multicultures and subsequently subcultures as long as they're working towards the common cause. If they're working against you, then you get divisiveness, and that's not good. So that's where the subcultures versus multiculturalism stuff kick in. And so in the, in the final phase of the, of the roadmap, what should leaders be doing during the strengthen? phase what what's what are the specifics well hopefully when you get to this point you see momentum really build and you get more people who are wanting to put their hands up and being involved why is because they actually are starting to see it's it's a good thing to be involved in this culture change it's safe to make sure that these changes are occurring so therefore i'm willing to put my hand up and do something as a leader get out of the way <laughs> essentially that allow people to really step forward and we see this with some of our clients when they've been traveling this journey is that um, is I encourage the leaders to to encourage people lower in the organization to take this forward one you'll get more out of it you get more of a spread of people really committing to it and secondly you get this energy you get this real spark that people are going this is fantastic so when you look at organizations that have a strong culture that's where you'll see you'll see this is a spread that everyone gets it and that's why leaders are keeping an eye on it but they're letting it flow okay which leads me into this to one of one of my closing questions which is this idea that you write about of culture inflow mm. and is that the essence of it that you just let it go once you've at a certain yeah with the risk of doing too many metaphors but again it just paint the picture as is culture to me can be a bit like water. You know, it if you let it flow, it will find its level. And like a you know a flooded plain, it will find its level whether you like it or not. That's where culture you'll get a culture whether you like it or not. Those organisations and those um, societies who start to put some channels around that is you start to get far more out of the water through irrigation, through hydroelectricity, blah, blah, blah. So you start to channel this water to get more out of it. Now, you don't want it too tight because then it can be quite piercing. You know, interestingly, water can be quite piercing. But if you get the right framework and the right boundaries, then you start to get it in flow and you start to get it working for you, not just existing. So culture in flow is how do we get that flow and every organisation is slightly different depending on their starting point and where they want to go, as I said before. So that's really the sort of the final thing is starting to leave that sense that how do I get the flow right? So you, you, you finish the book up with this idea of the, the, the best next step. So where, where do people go? If they, if they think that their culture's not where it needs to be, well, well, what's the best next step? Um. Well, given that I'm, well, I'll go back to the analogy around the learning planet. Yeah. Right? So you get, obviously, you get resources, you get knowledge, you get awareness, and so on, and that's 
where the bulk the book fits in and there's plenty of resources than, and things that talk about culture but you know hopefully the, the power of culture as a book allows you to do that when you're in the town and when you're in it sometimes it's useful to get a guide sometimes it's useful to have someone who knows the nuances of of the town and be able to guide you through that and when if you've ever had a guide in a in a town the richness that comes out of that experience is something you see things you wouldn't have seen so getting support through that from people who know and you can find people internally who are very good at it um, externally having people like you know like, like um, consultants um, the benefit of that is that they have an objective view the only loss for them is they don't get asked back if they ask the tough question <laughs> it's a bit harder for employees because they can lose their job mm. and there's so sometimes employees are maybe are less willing to ask some of the tougher questions. So there's two sides a consultant can do. One is willingness to ask the tough question, give objective data, and secondly is um, they know what they're doing, hopefully. Um, so the best next step is, is to arm yourself with knowledge. Get really exploring what that looks like. Get people advocates within your business to be able to join join the force so to speak because it's really hard to do alone um, and get some good advice now if people want to find out more about you and and the work that you're doing where should they go so two two things one is if you want to buy the book um, which is a, often a good start so the power of uh, is a website it's um, that's where you can buy the book it's self-published so you won't find it in the bookstores I might change that next year, but um, come to us direct and more than happy to help you out. Uh, secondly, from a consulting perspective and where we can, if people are wanting a little bit more than just the book and some advice on where they're at, then the business is called Composure and composure.com.au is the website. It's got all the details, more than happy to have a conversation and, and um, hopefully this has helped uh, crystallise what culture is in organisations and crystallise for people who are listening to this that thinking, oh, I haven't thought of it that way. Hmm. And before we finish up, any last words on leadership and culture? Well, I'm very passionate about it, as you can <laughs> probably tell. Um, and I think I think when you, when, you, when you explore it, and this is when we explore it with our clients, is that... Uh, the things you discover about yourself, the thing, I always have it, uh, you know, if people have a growth mentality, you know, they really want to grow and that's growing as an individual, then some of this work, because it is when you start to really explore it further, because it is behavioral, is understanding, discovering about yourself is um, scary, but exciting. If you have a growth mentality to be the best version of yourself, then this work can be fabulous. Secondly, I like teams, so a lot of sporting teams and my background is in teams. So um, whilst it's complex, there's nothing better than seeing a team come together and the excitement that they get and the energy they get from working together. And thirdly is the organisational um, growth. So eventually or you know, essentially organisations um, uh, create the fabric of our society and, and how we do it and they've got to be successful. If they're not successful, then they can't invest in teams they can't invest in people so uh i uh there's a parting word is if you want to grow this is a great great spot to grow um, and understanding more about human behavior is a rich topic and it's a lifelong learning well jerry thank you so much for for being a guest on the synergy and leadership podcast really appreciate it all the best thank you very much for having me Well, that wraps up episode 59 of the Synergy and Leadership Podcast, another great interview with another author. So I'd like to encourage you to head on over to the Synergy Group website and engage in the conversation with us. Tell us what you liked about the episode. Tell us who you'd like to interview. Tell us what sort of content you'd like us to deliver. And if you're an iPhone user, please feel free to head over to Apple's site and leave us a review. So in next week's episode, I speak with Brian Whitefield, who is the author of Winning Conversations, How to Turn Red Tape into Blue Ribbon. It's another great author interview, and until then, really love to hear what you think. Happy listening.